Thank you, thank you for coming. I'd like, I'm going to welcome and introduce uh, a very distinguished visiting uh, speaker. Um, professor Elsa Reichmanis is the Brook Myers Professor of Sustainability and a Professor in the School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, provided, pr um, prior to being in Georgia Tech, she was a Bell Labs Fellow and Director of the Materials Research Department at Bell Labs in New Jersey. She received her PhD in Bachelor of Science in degrees in Chemistry from Syracuse University, which is in New York, I think. Yes. In New York, yeah. Um, she's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and has received several awards for her work. She's been active in professional societies and she served in, as a 2003 president of the American Chemical Society and has participated in many national research activities. Um, the list of her accomplishments is very long um, and uh, perhaps since we've already used up some of her time, maybe we'll uh, truncate it there and, 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 and take it in thread, but um, please, over to you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and it's really a pleasure for me to be here to speak to you about some of the research that we're doing uh, related to polymers for electronic and photonic applications uh, in my labs at Georgia Tech. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, great. So I, I'm probably going to demonstrate uh, my uncoordinated nature uh, because I don't like staying put and pointing with mouses is kind of weird. So you're, you're going to have to follow me. I will follow you. All right. So um, the title of my talk is Polymer Semiconductors and talking about ordering, charge transport, uh, and macro scale mobility. And, and so if we, I was going to start a little bit with an introduction on Georgia Tech. Uh, and the top three uh, images are of some of the buildings at Georgia Tech the two on the outside from within the Ford Environmental Science and Engineering Building, which is, uh, houses my labs. Uh, and the one uh, down in the corner is a view of Atlanta sort of in the evening close to sunset. So uh, Atlanta is a very nice place to be. So uh, any of you uh, interested in visiting Atlanta, please do contact us. Uh, we can arrange for a visit. We can arrange for presentations. Uh, if there are students here who might be interested in a postdoc opportunity, uh, please do consider uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, and Atlanta has a lot, of, a lot to offer, both from an education perspective, uh, but also culturally. All right, so polymers and electronics and photonics. So my, my first uh, foray into polymers came uh, when I joined Bell Labs after graduate school. And, and I wanted to do something that was a little bit more applications oriented than uh, what I had been doing uh, in organic chemistry as a student. Uh, and the, the first uh, effort that I had related to uh, developing polymers, specifically photoresist materials for microelectronics applications. And it is in fact polymers that effectively allowed uh, shrinking uh, what are a couple centimeter on a side single crystals of silicon, germanium, et cetera, from the single transistor that you see up in the one corner developed at Bell Labs in the 1940s time frame uh, down to nanometer scale images now and circuit features on very advanced integrated circuits that are used in uh, just about every technology that we come in contact with. I doubt that there's anybody in this room today who does not have a computer or a cell phone or, or something uh, that uses electronic circuitry. Uh, and it is in large part because of polymer technology that we've been able to make those advances. All right, so in addition to that though, polymers play a role as active uh, members of uh, circuits. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is where organic and polymer semiconductor materials can play a role as the active device layer. All right, so if we think about printed plastic electronics, uh, where the device layer is going to be an organic material, uh, there's certainly some differences. Uh, silicon technology, uh, you need to have a very expensive fabrication environment in order to manufacture silicon ICs. 
uh, a new fab today, uh, starting from the ground up, would likely cost more than five billion dollars. And very um, effective, efficient clean rooms are absolutely required. Uh, the minimum feature on devices uh, that are state of the art today are less than 30 nanometers, something on the order of 22 nanometers for the state of the art de commercial devices. Uh, and in uh, prototype production are devices with 14 nanometer features. The substrates are rigid, they're large area, and all the processing is, or most of the processing rather, is subtractive in nature. All right, well, if we think about all printed plastic electronics as an alternative, uh, we may be able to use inkjet printers. Uh, we could use the kinds of printing technologies that are common in the newsprint or magazine industries, uh, such as gravure or offset printing. Uh, we could think about roll-to-roll -roll processing, so we could have very efficient uh, large area printing and processing that just is not viable with inorganic hard substrates. Uh, we could also use uh, flexible substrates that could be conformable, you could bend them, uh, could be plastic, could be paper, um, and, and it could also be very thin glass. Right? But there are a wider range of substrates that we might be able to use for polymer or organic based devices. And in addition to that, the processing uh, could be additive, uh, sort of ink-like, where we're not using as much material. Uh, and, and we could simply print the material in the area where we need to have a particular feature. All right, so if we think about uh, sort of the figure of merit uh, for semiconductor materials, all right, that's typically uh, thought about in terms of the sort of how effectively charges transport uh, through a thin film material as measured in mobility or centimeters squared per volt second. All right, if we look at the mobilities of single crystal silicon, I'll try to use this thing, um, the mobility of silicon is greater than 1,000 centimeters squared per volt second. Are organic materials going to reach that? I suspect not. Uh, there's, I don't see any way, at least in my lifetime and probably my children's and grandchildren's lifetimes, that organic or polymer materials are going to reach that level of performance. All right, but then if we look at amorphous silicon, amorphous silicon has a mobility only in the range of 0.1 to 1 centimeter square per volt second. All right, and if we look at organic and polymer materials, we certainly see that some solution processed organics and polymers are now, now being produced with mobilities in the range of about 0.1 to greater than one, so that they really are in the range of where amorphous silicon is. So we can start thinking about applications where Amorphous silicon is typically used, but perhaps we can now think about using polymers or organic materials that are going to be flexible. Uh, this would provide for alternatives, alternative applications where silicon cannot easily be used. So organics would not replace silicon as a future technology, but they could be used in applications where silicon may not be considered, uh, and probably lower end applications. Um, displays, backplanes for displays, are typically amorphous silicon uh, devices. Organic polymers could play a role in devices such as displays, flexible devices, uh, flexible displays. Uh, maybe imagine um, a Kindle. Uh, that instead of being uh, a rigid uh, device, could be a little bit more flexible device that would be more comfortable to hold if you're sitting in a nice comfortable armchair with your feet up, uh, you know, reading the morning magazine or reading your book. All right, so, so there are advantages to the organics. So, and, and this sort of summarizes what those advantages could be. 
Uh, the mobilities uh, could be a little more uniform, less limited uh, by surface states. Um, grain boundaries may not be as big of an issue, uh, but as you'll see later on in my presentation, they kind of are an issue. Um, one could think about covalently integrating a molecular receptor into the, the semiconducting active layer as a receptor for some sensor application, uh, maybe a biomedical sensor application. Uh, the processing is going to be a lot more uh, or done at a lower temperature, so it's going to be more moderate. Uh, less energy would be used. Uh, a wider variety of materials could be used within the device uh, so that lower temperature processing uh, would not be an issue. Solution deposition of the materials is possible, uh, which would enable large area coverage. Uh, the materials could be mechanically and thermally compatible uh, with plastic and other substrates. And then one can envision actually designing the organic structure specifically for a given circuit application. So, you know, there's a lot that one might be able to do with organics that may be a little bit more difficult with inorganic materials. All right, but then there are issues. Um, organic semiconductors certainly aren't at a point today where they can be commercial. Uh, there are issues related to the materials themselves. What are the structures that are going to give optimum performance? Uh, there's still a lot that is unknown about the devices. And specifically from a device physics perspective, how do these organic devices actually operate? What are the fundamental mechanisms compared to inorganic materials? Because organics and inorganics are a little bit different. And then what about processing? How do you actually process the organic materials in a way that you're going to get uniform, robust, reliable, thin films of solid organic material from a solution? All right, so how do you actually control that morphology? And, and so what my group has been focusing on is, is looking at uh, polymer and hybrid materials for plastic electronics and photovoltaics. Uh, we do a little bit of work in the design and development of new materials chemistries. Uh, we're, we're trying to develop uh, structure process property relationships uh, that will help guide uh, the design of robust materials for uh, plastic electronics applications and we sort of we want to understand the mechanisms associated with thin film morphology uh, formation and then how can we then guide that morphology in order to have a robust process that is reproducible. All right because if we can deposit a material once and can't reproduce those results that's really not going to be very effective if we're trying to do this on large scale and on a commercial scale. All right, so first looking at polymer materials. Uh, if you take a look at these AFM images, they're all AFM images of poly-3-hexylthiophene, which is a commercially available polymer semiconductor. Uh, these six AFM images are of the same batch of material, so there's no difference in molecular weight, there's no difference in properties or level of impurities. Same bottle, same batch of material. The one thing that is obvious in looking at those images is each one of them is different. And they're different because they've been processed in different ways. They've all been put, the polymer's been put in solution, Different solutions, the solvent may vary, the way that solution has been treated may vary. Once it's deposited on the silicon substrate, the morphology is different in the solid form. All right, so there is some mechanism associated with the formation of the conducting channel. Um, we need to be able to have some control of the microstructure and the nanostructure that's formed. We don't, we have um, crystallinity in the material, but it's not just crystallinity that's important with respect to the polymer. So 
we need to have some idea of what the role of crystallinity really is in driving performance in polymer semiconductors. All right, and then there are also conjugation effects. Uh, these are long chain polymers that are conjugated. Uh, they can undergo intra-chain conjugation. Uh, there are also effects of inter-chain conjugation. All right, so that leads to wanting to have some idea of the structure, processing, and property relationships as we work on these materials. All right, so just very briefly, the semiconductor polymer properties are really going to depend very strongly on how that morphology forms, how that material has been processed from solution. And the, the development of the final microstructure during film formation is not very well understood. And so looking at the role of microstructure, uh, first from what's <coughs> known in the literature, uh, certainly uh, there were efforts by Searinghaus um, early on demonstrating that radioregularity of poly-3-hexylthiophene plays an important role. And by that I mean sort of the orientation of the hexyl side group on the polymer backbone. All right, so how regular is this head-to-tail arrangement of the polymer? A, a very radioregular material uh, typically will lie perpendicular to the device substrate. One that is radiorandom will lie more flat on the substrate. And, and partly this difference in orientation also it determines how effectively charge gets transported through the film from one electrode to the other. The molecular weight of the polymer makes a difference. Uh, Klein and his co-workers showed that low molecular weight material, while it may be very crystalline on the substrate after deposition, uh, has a much lower mobility than higher molecular weight material that is more amorphous looking, more amorphous in nature. And part of the, the reason for that was speculated to be increases in the number of grain boundaries in the lower molecular weight, more crystalline material. And then it's also possible uh, to modify the surface of the semiconductor, change the polarity of the semiconductor, and, and how the, or change the polarity of the dielectric, rather, and that can impact how the semiconductor will interact with the surface and what its orientation on the surface will be. All right, so what is the actual role of the microstructure in defining charge transport characteristics and how can it be tuned. All right, and, and what I'll start out with is talking about some of the work that we've been doing in our labs related to how we can manipulate the morphology of poly-3-hexylthiophene in solution in order to then control that microstructure. All right, so looking at conducting channel formation, uh, we're using spin coating for the most part. Uh, we dissolve poly-3-hexylthiophene in a solvent. We drop it onto a device substrate. We form a thin film of material, and then we make the device measurement. All right, if we look at, instead of spin coating, if we just allow the solvent to evaporate uh, from that droplet on the device, and initially use chloroform as a solvent, we notice that the drain current fluctuates during thin film formation. And as a result, what we believe is happening is that the polymer chains rearrange as a function of time, and then we get percolation, a percolation network uh, through the film. We get current uh, flowing through the film, and then we, we can measure a mobility. Uh, there are bulk and interface effects in those measurements, uh, and we also don't really know what's happening uh, to the microstructure of the film as that microstructure is forming. If we look at, so using chloroform as a solvent, it it's a low boiling point solvent and evaporates really quickly, so there's very little that we can do to actually interrogate that droplet 
as solvents evaporating. All right, so we started looking at higher boiling point solvents. Uh, and if we look at chloroform, thiophene, and trichlorobenzene, it, the time required to form a thin film is extended, basically relative to the boiling point of the solvent. Uh, we typically get a percolation network in, from all of these systems. And with trichlorobenzene, the, the time frame is long enough that we can now start to spectroscopically interrogate that droplet to see if we uh, can identify changes that are occurring during solvent evaporation. All right, so we did this using micro Raman spectroscopy. And uh, what we find is that, you know, if we wait, uh, we'd see a very sharp rise uh, in drain current uh, roughly uh, 10 to 12 hours after depositing that droplet. The time frame can change depending on uh, conditions in the room during that evaporation process, but the, the trend is always the same. All right, and if we do micro Raman measurements, and in particular polarized optical measurements using Raman spectroscopy, we also see that there's a liquid crystalline phase that forms at some point prior to complete evaporation of the solvent. All right. and, and it appears that this liquid crystalline phase is coincident with a maximum in the mobility that we see as solvent is evaporating. And then when solvent is completely evaporated, the mobility drops a little bit. All right, so what we're interested in investigating further is whether we can now manipulate order using a liquid crystalline phase uh, in order to optimize macroscopic charge transport through the film. All right, so if we look at the onset of drain current, all right, we can look at the spectrum uh, in a number of different regions. And in particular, if you look at the region from B to C, there's a relatively sharp change in the slope uh, of the drain current versus time in this one region. And, and it takes place during about two minutes, which is relatively short on the time scale of overall solvent evaporation. All right, so if we look at that particular time frame and look at the Raman signal from the droplet in this time interval, we see changes in that system as well. All right, so initially, we effectively have a spectrum that doesn't look like much at all. And then over a period of two minutes, we see a signal uh, that appears that is quite distinct and quite sharp. All right, if we now take that signal and compare it to the Raman signal of both radioregular poly-3-hexylthiophene and radio-random P3HT, uh, we see that initially the spectrum looks very much like radio-random P3HT, so we, we're speculating that at this stage in solution, uh, the polymer is sort of isotropically um, distributed uh, through the solvent uh, with no particular orientation. All right. After uh, points C and D, the spectrum resembles that of radioregular P3HT, which is a semi-crystalline material and is much more aligned uh, and has some level of ordering within grains of the solidified polymer. All right, so within this very short period of time, we, we are getting a transition from sort of an isotropic random solution that has a little bit of solvent to one that is much more highly oriented which has very little solvent, but also in this region, we can now look at the, the P3HT signals and deconvolute them to extract out 
sort of the ratio of uh, sort of highly ordered versus somewhat less ordered states of P3HT. And we see that there is a, a change in that distribution in a very short time period, sort of when most of the solvent has evaporated from the film, but there is still just a little bit of solvent remaining. So we're speculating that there's a period where we are getting a lyotropic liquid crystalline phase form, but we are also having sort of rapid nucleation followed by crystallization of P3HT chains. And in the final state, we have sort of a polycrystalline network of poly-3-hexothiophene. All right, so we're looking at that now and in some results that are preliminary at this point, but, and also there are some results that we'd like to try to reproduce. Uh, we were able to make very concentrated solutions of poly-3-hexothiophene, draw them into a capillary, and from the UV spectra, and also the um, polarized optical microscopic images, those the P3HT that's been drawn into a capillary does have uh, exhibits birefringence and long range order along with monodomain character. We, we're consistently able to generate the monodomain uh, samples. What we have not been very good at is reproducibly generating samples from these monodomains that appear to be solid-like and appear to be, I'd say, macroscopically crystalline. Uh, we've seen it on a couple of occasions. Uh, we believe that the um, sort of the processes that are used and the handling of the samples uh, are, is very critical to generating these longer range ordered uh, materials. And so that's something that we're actively trying to reproduce at this point uh, and hope to get uh, sort of macroscopic single crystals of P3HT that we can then characterize um, more thoroughly and also manipulate uh, the crystals uh, in a device orientation to explore sort of the impact of anisotropy on an actual crystalline, single crystalline material of the polymer. All right, so that's what we're trying to do sort of on a larger scale. Separately, we can take solutions of poly-3-hexothiophene and treat them in a number of different ways that sort of leads to uh, nanoaggregates being formed in the solution phase. And those nanoaggregates are maintained and uh, continue uh, to be present in solidified thin films, and that leads to enhanced charge transport. All right, so if we take a solution of P3HT in chloroform and ultrasonicate it, um, we get a, we go from what starts out as an orange solution uh, to one which is sort of a dark purple, almost black solution. Uh, and in the solution state, uh, we see the appearance of uh, bands at lower wavelength uh, indicating the presence of more highly ordered structures within this solution. If we then take that solution and use it to deposit a thin film, we end up with a film that uh, has bands that are redshifted. Can't use this mouse redshifted from the, the untreated material, and we see a pronounced shoulder that's indicative of uh, more pi pi stacking, and again, a more ordered film. All right, so if we look at the crystallinity, and first looking at AFM images of P3HT with increased treatment time with ultrasonic irradiation, uh, we see crystallite fibril structures forming over a period of time. And if we look at the crystallinity of those films, 
the crystallinity of the films also increases over that same period of time. Right? But if we look at the mobility of those films, we see that there's a saturation of the mobility after about two minutes of ultrasonication. All right, and that sort of is similar to what the absorption spectrum looks like. All right, so what we believe is happening is that we have, a percol again, a percolation type charge transport mechanism all right, with uh, sort of a two order of magnitude increase in mobility and, and certainly that saturates in about one to three minutes. All right, so the multi-phase morphology appears to be something that is very important in charge transport in P3HT. And it's actually something that Steve Holcroft had predicted almost 20 years ago now when he was looking at some initial studies on P3HT and predicted that transport within the material is a function of highly ordered states having some quasi-ordered states and also having disordered regions within that system. All right, so ultrasonication is one way to be able to induce uh, molecular ordering uh, in P3HT prior to deposition of the thin film. All right, it's also possible to do that uh, by using a binary solvent system. And in particular, if that binary solvent is selected from uh, a number of solvents that have relatively high vo volatility, but can also undergo hydrogen bonding. And the importance of the hydrogen bonding interaction is that uh, with hydrogen bonding, uh, the solvent system can form a eutectic that is higher boiling uh, than either solvent alone, and that as solvent evaporates during the deposition process, that the boiling point of the remaining solvent increases as the solubility of the polymer in that solvent decreases. All right, so by having a mixture, and in this case of acetone and chloroform, uh, by adding only about two milliliters or two weight percent acetone to a largely chloroform solution, we don't really change the solubility characteristics of P3HT in the solvent at all. But what we do change is how the thin film processed from that binary solvent behaves. All right, and in particular, there's an increase in crystallinity of the material as we add a little bit of acetone to this chloroform mixture. And at about 2 weight percent acetone, we also see a fairly dramatic increase in the mobility of that system. All right, and what we think may, is probably happening is that we are changing sort of the solubility space of the solvent and the polymer, uh, and we've used Hansen solubility parameters to, to explore the solubility characteristics. And what we've determined is that for P3HT, uh, there's sort of an optimum number of solvents that should be effective. And what's interesting is that the best solvents aren't necessarily the ones that are really good solvents for P3HT. Rather, the best solvents appear to be ones that are sort of on the surface. And they're reasonable solvents, maybe just good enough to dissolve the polymer, but not really good. And, and that's an important feature of, in identifying a solvent for the semiconducting polymers in that, that the solvent characteristics can help induce sort of aggregation and alignment of the system. All right, and, and so in particular with the acetone case, uh, we're 
we have a randomized network of polymer chains which as solvent is evaporating uh, the the proportion of acetone and chloroform is changing to one which is less advantageous for P3HT and that helps to induce aggregation and ordering in the polymer system which then leads to improved charge transport. So we've started looking at the um, aggregation phenomena of P3HT in solution and, and from some studies that we've been doing uh, we've started combining processes where in one case that I've shown here we've been looking at um, adding a non-solvent to a good solvent P3HT mixture and after adding the non-solvent then adding doing an ultrasonicated treatment. All right, and again what we find is that through this combined process we can actually optimize the length of the nanofibers that are formed in the P3HT film and as we optimize that length we also increase crystallinity and in addition improve the charge transport characteristics. And what my student has been, been looking at in the case of P3HT here is to bring this now back to sort of a traditional two-step or two-step recrystallization model where there's an element of nucleation followed by growth of the P3HT aggregates or nanocrystallites. And so if we can balance the proportions of non-solvent followed by the ultrasonication treatment, we can optimize the number of uh, crystallites or crystallization, uh, recrystallization sites, nucleation sites being formed in solution still have a sufficient level of poly-3-hexylthiopene left in the solution uh, that is available for growth from those crystallite chains. Right? And so this is something which we're exploring further and also want to start to apply to alternative uh, pi-conjugated semiconductors to determine whether it's actually uh, a more universally um, applicable process. And, and I suspect since we are working with polymers, going back to more traditional polymer literature and understanding polymer crystallization and looking at P3HT with that uh, perspective, I think we will find that there are a lot of similarities uh, between the two. All right, so that's sort of given you a little bit of insight into sort of the process oriented and solution treatment work that's been going on in my lab. Uh, I've also got some synthetic uh, programs going and this is just highlighting one example uh, where um, my student looked at incorporating two different uh, electron acceptor materials into a largely uh, polythiophene uh, backbone. All right, and, and so he used uh, both uh, the, um, uh, the bithia, uh, bith bithia thiazine and also incorporated uh, diketoperolopyrrol as a separate and distinct unit. All right, and in addition to incorporating, you know, the two acceptor units, uh, he also looked at the impact of the side chain on the solubility correct characteristics, uh, where he had uh, sort of a branch side chain uh, in hopes of improving the solubility of the material. Uh, he looked at having that branching point uh, near the backbone of the polymer and more remote from the backbone. And then he also compared that to a long linear alkyl chain. Right. Um, he designed the synthetic methodology 
uh, and did all the synthesis. And I have to say this was done by a chemical engineering student, not a chemistry student. Uh, and when he joined my labs, he had not done any organic synthesis, but took on a very heavily synthetic project uh, and is now effectively a polymer synthetic chemist. Um, but I won't go through the details. All right, so if we characterize those materials, uh, as we go from sort of the uh, 7B uh, is the material where the branching point is near the backbone, uh, and then the purple materials uh, and the dark blue material uh, are first the two polymers, uh, one with uh, the linear side chain, the other with a branch side chain remote from the backbone, and the blue is the oligomeric material with the branched uh, side chain remote from the backbone. All of these materials are crystalline uh, as determined by uh, the GWAX measurements. And if we look at uh, so both the despacing and the pi pi stacking distance, uh, they all do have uh, they're all aligned uh, in nicely oriented uh, on the substrate, and we expect the alignment to be uh, perpendicular to that substrate. Right? If we then look at sort of the characteristics uh, of each of these materials, largely comparing the, the side chain feature, uh, what we find is that if we have sort of a branching position that's remote to the backbone, the solubility of that material is very good in a wide range of solvents because of that branch position. Also, the pi-pi intermolecular interactions end up being very good. The chains stack relatively closely together. All right, if we have that branching point closer to the backbone, uh, Solubility is good, but the pi-pi intermolecular interactions are reduced, largely because that branching point close to the backbone leads to some twisting in that backbone, which means that when they're stacked, they have to be a little bit more separated, so the, the stacking distance is a little bit wider. From the perspective of the linear chain, it's not as soluble. Uh, it doesn't have that additional floppy, organic, greasy stuff. And, but it does have very good pi-pi stacking where the interactions are superior. All right, so it appears that having that remote branching position, both the solubility and the pi-pi intermolecular distance can be optimized. All right, so does that actually translate into an optimized material from the perspective of at least semiconductor devices. All right, so when we make those devices in thin film form, we actually find that those characteristics do translate. All right, so the linear material, which is not very soluble and as a result is a little bit more difficult to handle, uh, has a relative, has a good mobility, but not a great mobility. All right, so the mobility there for whole transport is 0.4 centimeters squared per volt second. All right, having the branching point near the backbone improves the solubility. That actually allows a higher molecular weight polymer to be formed, and the mobility that, the maximum mobility that we may be able to achieve in that polymer goes up to 0.8 centimeters square per volt second. Also reasonably good. But if we now put that branching point remote from the backbone, what we find is that we can achieve a mobility of up to 3 centimeters square per volt second. And, and that's not with a lot of process optimization. So we actually believe that by engineering the, the 
side chains of a polymer semiconductor, we can actually have a lot of impact on the solubility, which can then help us increase the molecular weight sufficiently that we can get longer range ordering and improved macroscale charge transport. All right, so effectively what I hope I've been able to show is that uh, sort of the molecular structure uh, really does need to be taken account in conjunction with how we process the materials. And both of those together are going to influence sort of electronic properties and device performance uh, for polymer materials in a device architecture. Whether it's a transistor kind of architecture that we've, I've been showing here, or whether it's in an OPV kind of architecture. All right, and we really need to worry about all aspects of structure uh, in terms of defining performance, all right? Because we need ultimately to have highly reproducible and robust materials and processes to be able to have manufacturable, robust systems in place. All right, and there is a role in the intermediate phases that the polymer goes through during the processing and during solvent evaporation. All right, and all of this is something that sort of needs to be investigated in a synergistic way so that we can really pinpoint the important factors that need to be looked at and be able to control those factors during, device, during fabrication of the devices. Um, so with that, what I'd like to do is close, ask if you have any questions, but also thank uh, my students, who are the ones who really did the work, not me, and the funding agencies who have provided support uh, for the program. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. value and questions please. Yes. In the first half you didn't mention what the source and the get and the drain were for the the neural devices. All right, so, uh, so whether so they construct the material. All right, so the devices that we've been using for testing are um, silicon is the gate electrode uh, with about three hundred Angstroms of silicon oxide is the gate dielectric. Uh, and then we have um, gold electrodes for the source drain electrodes. And they're, uh, de um, they're photo photolithographically defined, uh, but it's gold on chromium. Uh, and then we deposit uh, the semiconductor on top of that structure. So you could electrode deposit three hex or five feet. And so the question I have is, what, how does the mobility compare with electrode deposits? All right, so, yeah, so we haven't done three hexothiophene, uh, and I guess we're not set up to do the electrode deposition, so I don't know how that comparison is. I've seen uh, in the literature where uh, thiophene has been electrode deposited, mm -hmm. and I believe that the mobility results for thiophene are not as good as the solution process that we're seeing, but I can't swear to that. I have a second question. Sure. Okay. And, and that was in the second part, but when does the spaghetti become such that it kills the mobility? We don't really know. There, is, there certainly is a point where the spaghetti is way too much. Um, I was personally a little surprised that having as much as we had, um, the mobility actually is good. And I think that's because there are the, so charge is strictly transported at the interface between the dielectric and the semiconductor. And I suspect that the, it has something to do with the orientation of the semiconductor on the substrate. It's probably not perfectly vertical. It's probably somewhat angled. And the spaghetti somehow 
interacts in order to partly also maybe be a dialect, have some dialectic character to it. Um, and since it's that interface layer that's important, uh, it's really the PyPy stacking at that layer that's going to be important as opposed to what's above it. So it's not known is the short answer. And the other was the long-winded answer. <laughs> yes. Um, so I was interested in, in um, the process that you followed for selecting a binding solvent, mm -hmm. as, or the, at least the hydrogen bonding component of the binding solvent. I mean, it's, it's very similar to the process people use to select plasticizers for polymers. And in that, in that I, I think the understanding there is that the plasticizer is actually it integrates itself between the chains, the separate polymer chains. So is a similar sort of thing happening in these binary solvents? So I don't, well, so the, in the binary solvents that we looked at, I don't believe there's any solvent left after the, the film is dried. I, I suspect, so, so the eutectic for chloroform and acetone is 30% acetone, 70% chloroform. If you look at the solubility uh, of P3HT in chloroform with increasing acetone content, the solubility remains good up to about 3 or 4%. And then if you go beyond four or five percent, it's the solvent is just a poor solvent for P3HT. So by the time you get to 30 percent acetone, you cannot dissolve P3HT anymore. So what we think is happening is that as the solvent's evaporating, the, the solubility of P3HT is changing with time and, and the final concentration of solvent is, is closer to this 30-70 d mixture where P3HT is not very soluble. And it's that transition from good solvent to poor solvent that is impacting how the polymer is aggregating and crystallizing. So I actually think that what we need to do more of is really look at the sort of crystallization phenomena and, and draw from the polymer crystallization literature to understand what's happening. I don't think it's a plasticizer effect. Yes. Uh, so just going on with the solubility things, you mentioned solubility at two different junctures, and I'm wondering, because you were also talking later in the talk about the fact that the, the um, quality of the solvent impacts on the molecular weight you've achieved. Mm -hmm. Is this really a somewhat separate question from the binary solvent thing? Because in one case, you're actually looking at the solvent yeah. used during the polymerization, and you make it up front. Right. Is that right? Right. So, so I think the... Right, so the binary solvent thing is different. It's the process inside it. So that is, so that act, and, and the binary solvent thing isn't something that we actually looked at predictively to this is what, this is what we think is going to happen. This was a, a PhD student experimenting with what's going to happen if I put a few drops of acetone in here. And, and then that evolved into the more complete study. Um, with the, so when I was, l the other part that I think you're referring to is where we specifically added a non-solvent, not so much to change the boiling point in order to effect a, a gradual change in solubility of the material, but where we specifically looked at the synergistic effects of if we add a non-solvent, we know that we can affect aggregation of P3HT. If we do the ultrasonication, we also know that we can induce aggregation. But if we do both of these together, can we modulate what is happening and enhance 
the improvements that we see. And, and from that, it evolved into looking at, um, you know, as we doing a relatively um, expansive study of percentage of non-solvent that doesn't interact with the primary solvent and a range of times for ultrasonication, the, you know, there were trends that came out of that. And it was an optimum of non, amount of non-solvent with an optimum time of ultrasonication. And, and that led us to be thinking about more mechanistically what may be happening in the solution. And so th that led to thinking about crystallization and you know, generation of nucleation sites in solution. And then once we, we have, let's say, an optimum number of nucleation sites, can we now grow longer um, aggregated structures from those nucleation sites? So if one has aggregates and domains forming, you can, it's possible to construct theoretical models, computational models to explore the properties of certain types of aggregates. The other okay. question I had though was, is there any experimental analog of what you might try to computation? Is it possible experimentally to somehow isolate certain types of domains or aggregates and interrogate them? for their properties individually as opposed to the sort of composite bulk measurements that, uh, that, that, that you make? I wish we could. Mm -hmm. um, Has there been any progress in that direction that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. You know, I, there have been studies done on, on sort of films that have been prepared with quote unquote uh, nanofibers of P3HT. Um, and, and showing that there's anisotropy in the charge transport, you know, in the direction of the nanofiber. But it has not led to, let's say, an overall increase in the maximum mobility. Um, we're starting to look at um, trying to isolate the nanofibers mm -hmm and then take those nanofibers, uh, incorporate them into uh, either insulating polymers or um, semiconducting polymers and seeing whether we can influence the alignment direction. Um, and, and it appears that if we can do that effectively, we can see enhancements in mobility. Um, Is it possible to fabricate contacts directly on an individual fiber and make electrical measurements? I wish. So, so that's something which is going to be really, really challenging. Um, so it may be possible to do space charge limited measurements where you're looking at an individual fiber. Um, I that's sort of bordering on sort of being able to do measurements on an individual molecule. And though, yes, there are people who have done those molecular scale measurements, but I'm not sure how reliably they've really been able to do it. And if we got it, would we be able to then bring it back to the other measurements that we have? Um, I, it would really be nice to be able to get a measurement on an individual fiber or a group of fibers and, and see whether the, the aggregated fiber is in fact performing better from a transport perspective. Um, I at least don't know how to do that. I wish I did. If you've got any ideas, I'm... <laughs> a bit beyond. Normally we can't do that because there's students clamoring to get into a next ah, lecture. Sorry. So today, today we don't have that problem. So, so that's a 
no apology necessary, but, and I can see that the, uh, the room has been interested. But um, if, yeah. maybe, maybe I guess if, if you don't mind, we're, no, we're, I'm fine. We're, we can continue. Yeah. Like. Okay, is it possible to control the PPHT aggregation, control the size of the piston? So I, I believe we can control the size, uh, and I'm not sure how precisely yet, but through uh, the, the combination of adding a non-solvent and ultrasonication, uh, we can modulate the length of the individual P3HT fibers anywhere from yeah, about 75 to 100 nanometers in length, up to about 500 to 600 nanometers in length. Also, when the crystal forming, the orientation coming the perpendicular to the substrate surface, as well as the parallel to the perpendicular surface. Now, perpendicular surface is good for the transistor, right. but not good for the solar cell. We right. want for solar cell parallel orientation. Right. Is it possible to control the orientation? We, we believe it will be possible, uh, but we have not looked into it because it is possible to control the polymer orientation by changing the characteristics, the polarity of the substrate surface. So I think through treatments of the substrate with um, a self-assembled monolayer that would it would have to be experimentally determined what you'd like to have but I think it should be possible to to affect the orientation um, it, it may also be possible to include um, other components uh, that could lead to more of a columnar uh, phase structure and, and that's something that we're thinking about how we might be able to accomplish it. So, no, we haven't achieved it, but I think it's something that could be explored and, and I think it could be done. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a specialist in this field, but I'm just curious, uh, even if you're successful in preparation techniques, um, uh, how would you circumvent um, the uh, biodegradability of organics and the implications when you deploy these in real applications? All right, so P3HT is never going to be used anywhere. Well, never say never, uh, but P3HT is not a sufficiently robust material to be useful in an application. We're using P3HT for uh, most of these process studies largely because it's commercially available and we can get enough material to be able to explore the process space to see what we can do. We believe um, that what we learn from the P3HT studies will be applicable to other polymer semiconductor materials so that we'll be able to do the same sorts of things with different structures that do have better performance and some of the substituted donor acceptor materials that we prepared do have more robust characteristics from the standpoint of stability in the ambient. Also, you know, if we look at um, what the, the sensitivity of polymer semiconductors uh, to oxygen and moisture, I don't believe that that's going to be significantly worse than, uh, the, than OLEDs. Uh, and there are encapsulation technologies that have been developed for OLED devices such that you know, they are sufficiently robust to be used in real applications. So that, that's going to be a packaging issue. In terms of biodegradability um, and, and in terms of what is the overall impact going to be of these structures on the environment, that's something which does need to be taken into consideration and, and is certainly uh, 
of concern. Um, I, I believe that there are some organic devices that have been used uh, in biomedical applications. So inherently, I think that those issues can be overcome, but, but certainly they are not issues that have been solved and they should not be ignored. Okay, um, we've got two minutes over. Um, very generous, Oops. Mr. Cohen, Professor Rachmanis, thank you very much. Um, I might call a call halt to it now. Um, I, if I could just sort of do a little bit of an advertisement. This um, St. George Tech is a partner in the, the Australia US Institute for Advanced Photovoltaic, which is based here in, in the Spree School. Um, the, our organisation is, is very keen to. Um, to encourage cross-Pacific interactions um, in, in the PV field, and, and particularly with Georgia Tech. So, um, so if there's interest in, in collaborating and working at, um, between UNSW or the other um, Australian universities and with Georgia Tech, um, then um, please uh, speak, speak up to me later and, and we can see if we can make something happen and assist that and facilitate that. And certainly I'd be very interested in collaborating uh, where, where it would be appropriate. So if we get, um, thank you. Professor. Thank you.